Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 10 of The Devil's Brood, The Road to Bouvin, the most important battle in medieval Europe you have probably never heard of. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, John had won the struggle for the throne against his nephew Arthur of Brittany, signing a treaty with Philip, King of France, in exchange for a marriage alliance between Philip's son Louis and John's niece Blanche. The Treaty of Le Joulet seemed to bring peace, but John attempted to strengthen his control of Aquitaine without the hard work of winning support like his mother or simply demolishing rebel castles like his brother. Instead, he married the daughter of the Count of Angelin, even though she had already been promised in marriage to Hugh of the Lusignan family. The refusal to compensate the Lusignans for the insult sparked a revolt, but John won a major victory at Mirabeau, where he captured the Lusignans and Arthur. However, John allowed his prisoners to starve to death and probably killed Arthur himself, which led to revolts in Brittany, Anjou, and Aquitaine, enabling Philip to overrun Normandy. As a result, John had lost almost all of the Angevin territories on the continent by the fall of 1204. Confined to England, he began planning a campaign to regain his territories, but found himself in a conflict with the church. All of the Angevin kings had wanted practical power over the church in England, but Henry had learned the hard way to avoid a direct challenge, and Richard simply did not care as long as the church did not interfere with his military campaigns. However, John rashly picked a fight with the church and had the bad luck to force a showdown with a particularly effective pope. Focused on government rather than spiritual matters, Hubert Walter, Archbishop of Canterbury, had presided over the establishment of a professional administration in England. When he died in 1205, his replacement should be appointed by the monks of Christ Church, advised by the kingdom's bishops, but he should also be approved by the king. Since the monks and the king chose different candidates, they asked Pope Innocent III to mediate. Lobbied by several sets of envoys from the monks and the king, the pope concluded that neither candidate would be accepted by the other side and attempted to resolve an extremely time-consuming matter by nominating a compromise candidate, Stephen Langton. Instead of a polite letter of gratitude for his insightful solution, the Pope was surprised to learn that an infuriated John refused to allow Langton to enter England. This may seem to be an overreaction, but Langton had spent the past two decades at the university in Paris where he had constantly preached against the greed of kings. Increasingly angry letters were exchanged between the king and the pope until Innocent greatly escalated the situation and placed the entire kingdom of England under interdict on March 23, 1208, rather than simply punish the king. Church services would not be held until John bent the knee. It should not be a surprise that Innocent had refused to blink during his conflict with John, since the Pope had declared a crusade in southern France that same year to exterminate the Cathars simply because they followed a different version of Christianity. A man who was willing to unleash fire and slaughter on the residents of the Languedoc would not hesitate to deny religious services to the subjects of the King of England. In an age when religious tolerance was considered heresy, the church was omnipresent in England with 9,000 churches and as many chapels. Deprived of their regular church services, one would expect a religious population to protest to the king, but there is no evidence of any popular protests. Actually, the church's control of marriage was very recent, since it had traditionally been a secular matter. In 1200, a church council at Winchester had declared that marriages must first be announced in church three Sundays in a row, and the marriage must take place in front of the church. People continued to marry despite the interdict because the church had previously declared that all that was required was a public exchange of vows between two people of age, 12 or older. Yeah, 12. Yuck. Just. Although there were no burials in consecrated ground, the dying could receive absolution, and infants were still baptized. 
Basically, priests continued to provide the desired services and complied with the interdict by not providing unpopular services. Meanwhile, John was happy, since he had confiscated the clergy's assets and revenue. To put their wealth into perspective, the bishops and abbots owed one-seventh of the troops pledged to the crown by English landowners. Contemptuous of priests' failure to remain celibate, John had their mistresses and wives arrested and released only after the priests paid large fines. Previous interdicts had been speedy successes, so Innocent was surprised that this one had not gone according to plan. In 1209, the Pope raised the stakes and ordered Langton to excommunicate John, causing almost all of the bishops to leave England, since they could not deal with an excommunicate. This drastic measure should have ended the matter, since in theory, no one could interact with John without risking their own souls, except people feared hanging today more than a possible eternity in torment. John responded by looting churches and abbeys of anything of value. Aside from his power struggle with the Pope, John had feuded with one of his most loyal barons. William de Bruce had been with Richard when he died and was an early influential supporter of John, so he was rewarded with huge holdings in England, Wales, and Ireland. Working with William Marshall to expand English rule in Wales, he was notorious for his savage repression of the Welsh. De Bruce's fall began in the spring of 1206 when John permitted a lawsuit to proceed against him. This may not seem dramatic, but favored members of John's court were protected from litigation, and records of cases would end with the simple phrase, because the king wills it. The feud was not a personal spat, but the consequence of John's need for revenue to finance the reconquest of his lands in France. Realizing that the revenue supplied by England was insufficient, he looked towards Ireland. Since the island lacked an efficient tax collection administration, he introduced one, dividing Ireland into shires, but the shires would not follow the boundaries of the existing kingdoms. The English barons who had conquered Ireland would suffer from this new division, even though they had been loyal to John. Most dared not oppose the king, but de Bruce was a hard, aggressive man, who believed that he had the king's favor, so he resisted this new administrative division. John's break with de Bruce showed the danger of relying on the favor of a vindictive king. Believing that he had a good relationship with John, de Bruce had taken on a debt he could not pay to buy Munster and the city of Limerick, but he never paid the full amount, which was standard for favorites. But he lost his status as favorite when he resisted the administrative division, so John called in the bill. When John's cold war against de Bruce became too much, the family fled to Ireland seeking the protection of William Marshall, who had also fallen out of favor with John. De Bruce, his son-in-law Walter de Lacy, and Marshall were attempting to limit the king's expansion of royal authority in Ireland. Realizing that Ireland had become a haven for bishops and lords who had crossed the crown, John decided to bring the island firmly under English control. Learning that the king was gathering a massive fleet, Marshall preempted John and crossed over to England to submit. It soon became clear that Marshall had made the right choice, since 700 ships transported several thousand foot soldiers and crossbowmen, roughly 800 knights, and a large force of miners, carpenters, stonemasons, and ditchers in June 1210. Forced to leave Ireland with his tail between his legs when he was 18, John probably relished the opportunity to impose his will on the island. The first target was Ulster, the stronghold of de Lacy's brother Hugh, who sheltered de Bruce's wife and son. Observing an enormous army marching towards his lands, de Lacy fled to exile in France. Ulster, Meath, and Munster submitted, and the lands of the Norman lords in Ireland were redistributed among John's followers. Most important, John was assured of a steady revenue stream from Ireland when he sailed for home. Having succeeded in Ireland, John forced the King of Scotland to sign a humiliating treaty in August 1209. De Bruce's wife and adult son had sought sanctuary in Scotland but were handed over. The use of De Bruce's wife and son as hostages was standard, except that John was John and allowed them to starve to death. The king clearly wanted his barons to fear him, and they learned that lesson. 
but they also learned that he could never be trusted. The following year, John turned his attention to Wales. Lords like de Bruce, Marshall, de Lacy, and Chester were intended to keep the Welsh contained in their lands, but these lords also had extensive holdings in Ireland. Since these lords, except for Chester, were busy in Ireland, Prince Llewellyn had seized the opportunity to rebel. So John first marched through the lands of Marshall and de Bruce to remind their tenants of his power, and then led a campaign of fire and destruction into Wales that forced Llewellyn to send his wife, John's illegitimate daughter Joan, to negotiate terms of surrender with her father. While it appeared that John was dominant, his position was more fragile than it seemed. Tiring of John's harsh rule and opposed to an expensive campaign to retake Normandy, the powerful northern lords Estuche de Vichy and Robert Fitzwalter apparently led a plot to overthrow him in August 1212 and install Simon Montfort, the Earl of Leicester, as his replacement. When the plot was discovered, they fled England. Realizing that his actions over the past few years had fueled this revolt, John made efforts to calm the situation and repaired relations with William Marshall. Actually, the rebellion should not have surprised him. While Richard and Henry had been cruel, they had spent little time in England, so their cruelty had occurred in brief stages. John was cruel all of the time, and his mood swings were hard to predict. The fate of trusted followers like the de Bruce family showed the other lords that none of them were safe from the paranoid whims of the tyrant John. To be honest, the rebellion would have occurred eventually, regardless of the king's personality, since it was a reaction to the spread of royal authority. At that point in John's reign, there were 20 earls, 200 barons, and 5,000 knights, in a population of roughly 4 million where perhaps two-fifths were free. Although some knights served as household knights for barons, many more were simply middle-sized landowners supplying much of the royal administration, including sheriffs and judges. The development of a professional legal system had begun during Henry's reign, and a professional judiciary existed by 1200. The average person benefited from this increased emphasis on professional government and could even take nobles to court. But it is doubtful that the barons welcomed having to deal with lawsuits by grubby farmers and merchants. To be fair, Henry and Richard had had difficult relations with their barons, but while they had sometimes levied heavy taxes to pay for wars, John had transformed occasional taxes into an annual affair. In particular, he charged outrageous succession fees, essentially an early form of inheritance tax. These fees were intentionally too heavy to be paid in full in order to keep the barons in debt, thus dependent on his favor. To further weaken the barons, the money taken from them for succession fees or permission to marry a widow or an heiress was used to reward the mercenary captains who did John's dirty work, men like Fox de Brut, Sabri de Molon, and Gerard d'Athé. So, what has been happening in France? Well, Louis was knighted on May 17th, 1209. 21 years old, Louis was ready for more responsibility, but the French government did not really have a place for him, since both his father and his grandfather had succeeded to the throne when they were still teenagers. Although 21 was the age of majority, when nobles who had inherited estates as minors could legally take control of those estates, Philip refused to name his son Count of Artois, which he had inherited from his mother, since the county's revenues would make him a threat. A similar situation had twice driven the young king to rebel, but Louis proved to possess more patience. Possibly the example of the damage caused by the near-constant revolts in the Angevin dynasty was sufficient warning. Also, Philip's love of a good life had left him bald and overweight, so Louis may have found it easier to be patient. Actually, Louis's loyalty, or rather his pragmatic attitude, may have been a key factor in Philip's victory against John since the Capetians remained united, unlike their Angevin rivals. While Philip had been spared the generational conflict that had plagued the Angevin Federation, he faced the possibility of losing Flanders as an ally. Count Baldwin of Flanders had died on crusade in 1205, and his two young daughters had been raised by Louis and Blanche. Flemish weavers depended on fine wool from England, so an alliance with England would, was popular. Determined to prevent just such an alliance, 
Philip arranged for Joan, the eldest daughter, to marry Ferran, the fourth son of King Sancho of Portugal, in January 1212. Flanders had become the most densely populated urban region of Europe, with numerous large cities. In Italy, the other great urbanized kingdom, each great city controlled an area roughly the size of Flanders. The cities possessed considerable freedom, and they only owed military service outside the town if an enemy invaded Flanders. Rule over a county filled with independent cities may not have been ideal, but it was still pretty good for a fourth son. Ferran's reign did not start well. Before going on crusade to earn indulgences for his sins, Baldwin had seized two towns that were part of the county of Artois. When Ferran refused to return those two towns, Louis led an army to capture them. Ferran Louis then signed a treaty in February where Louis formally received the towns in exchange for a guarantee to not claim any other part of Flanders. Philip either approved of the action or was unwilling to risk conflict by disciplining his son. To be honest, it is doubtful that he would disapprove of an action that increased France's revenues. However, the negligible increase in revenue would have a trade-off, the loss of a pliable ally, since Ferran began to explore an alliance with John. Observing John's efforts to organize a coalition against the Capetians, Philip decided that he did not need to remarry since he had two healthy sons, so he ended his feud with the church over Ingeborg, who had spent the past 20 years under house arrest in a castle. Although Philip restored Ingeborg to her position as queen, he did not accept her as his wife. By early May, John was aware that Philip had gathered an army and a fleet so he would invade in the very near future. Justly terrified, he worked to remove papal support from Philip's invasion and sped up negotiations with the papal legate, Pandulf, who arrived on May 13, 1213. Two days later, John had reconciled with the Pope and even declared his kingdom a papal fief, although this was unlikely to, to, to deter Philip. Landing in England on July 9th, Stephen Langton formally relieved John of the sentence of excommunication. However, the Pope would not reverse the interdict until the minor matter of the church's seized lands had been settled and payment was made in full. In the end, John was saved by Philip's overconfidence. Having raised an enormous army, Philip had taken the opportunity to punish the Count of Flanders, who had refused to join the expedition. So he marched his army through Flanders to Bruges, leaving devastation behind him. Instead of joining his fleet, anchored only a few miles away at Dam, Philip could not resist the temptation of disciplining Flanders further and laid siege to the city of Ghent. It is important to remember that Philip's acquisition of Normandy had made the threat of an invasion of England a reality, prompting John to invest in a navy, which had grown to a hundred ships by 1213. That investment produced a stunning return on May 30th when the English fleet, commanded by the Earl of Salisbury and Count Renaud of Boulogne, discovered the lightly defended French fleet at anchor and destroyed most of the ships. Hearing the news, Philip calmly accepted the blame. No, I am joking. He unleashed his rage on Flanders, forcing the cities of Ghent, Bruges, and Ypres to pay heavily to avoid the consequences of his fury. Encouraged by the naval victory, which ended the threat of a French invasion, John decided to make an all-out attempt to regain his possessions on the continent and increased his exploitation of the nobles, setting new records for fees. The money was needed to bribe the counts of Holland, Boulogne, and Flanders to join his campaign to support German Emperor Otto against Philip. To John's irritation, his invasion was opposed by Fitzwalter and de Vesci. Wait, hadn't they fled in 1212? Well, Innocent thought they had fled England because they supported the Pope, so they had been permitted to return as part of the agreement between John and Innocent that ended the interdict. Once back in England, they opposed John's planned invasion, claiming that they were not required to serve overseas since they only held lands in England, and numerous barons followed their example. Philip had benefited from the decade-long struggle for control of the Holy Roman Empire, 
France's powerful neighbor, Emperor Henry's death in 1198 sparked a struggle between his brother Philip of Swabia and Otto of Saxony, John's nephew. The assassination of Philip in 1208 seemed to leave Otto the undisputed claimant, but he soon found himself facing Henry's son Frederick, supported by France. Angered by Philip's meddling in the German succession, Otto was an easy recruit for John's grand coalition. Since all of his allies were located near each other, it would have seemed logical to sail to Flanders and launch a massive invasion of Normandy. Instead, John became greedy and decided to organize a two-pronged campaign. Landing in La Rochelle in February 1214, he burned his way through Aquitaine until his Lusignan rivals finally bent the knee in May. Having gained control of Aquitaine, John moved north in June, Although numerous barons switched sides, Peter, the Duke of Brittany, remained loyal, confirming Philip's decision to have him marry Alice, the eldest daughter of Constance and Guy de Troyes. As the second son of the Count of Dreux, Peter lacked a power base outside of Brittany and would hopefully remain subservient to the French crown. Regardless, John captured both Nantes and the new Duke of Brittany. When Anjou, the capital of Anjou, surrendered without a battle, it seemed that John might actually regain his lands. But this rapid advance was slowed by the strong defense of the garrison of La roche au moins a satellite castle of Anjou which controlled the key road. While John was delayed by the siege, Philip took the risk of dividing his forces and sent Louis with the experienced Marshal of France and a sizable army. Although Louis was outnumbered, John's barons from Aquitaine refused to fight. Faced with a setback, John reacted as he always did. He ran, riding over a hundred kilometers in two days, leaving behind siege equipment and supplies as well as most of his men. With John routed by himself, Louis had the easy task of recapturing castles that quickly switched sides. To be honest, this was a more serious defeat than it appears since John had failed to prove to formerly loyal barons that they could depend on him. Meanwhile, the coalition lacked a clear leader. Otto was senior, but had brought few men. The Earl of Salisbury was nominally in command since he represented the money, but he was outranked by the numerous counts. Forced to wait for Otto, the coalition had given Philip the time to gather an army. When the coalition found Philip's army strung out near the bridge of Bouvin on July 27th, Otto and Renault were unwilling to start a battle, but were pressured into it by John's chief mercenary, Hugh the Bov, who pointed out that following John's setback in the south, a victory was needed, and John was paying them. By the time the coalition had engaged the French rearguard, most of the French army had already crossed. Realizing that he could either fight or see a considerable part of his army destroyed, Philip quickly moved his army back across the bridge and then had it demolished to encourage the troops to fight hard. Philip may not have been a true battlefield commander like Richard, but either he or one of his generals was a talented organizer. Because if the movement of the army had been badly handled, the whole French army would not have marched across in time, giving the coalition an easy victory. Despite the coalition's greater numbers, Otto's Germans were strung out for several miles and were unlikely to arrive in time for the battle. In fact, the French had already completed their lines and attacked before the coalition had formed their lines. As a result, the early clashes favored the French and the Duke of Brabant, a reluctant supporter of the coalition, withdrew from the battle. After three hours of fighting in the hot sun, Count Ferrand was badly wounded and forced to surrender and his demoralized Flemings either surrendered or fled. There is no doubt that it was a bloody battle. Knights were hard to kill and were usually captured for the ransom, but roughly 10% of the knights died in the battle. Despite the defeat of the Flemings, Otto's men penetrated deep into the French center and unhorsed Philip, who was saved by the sacrifice of a household knight, enabling the king to reach safety. A French counterattack nearly captured Otto, but many of his knights were captured, delaying pursuit. Only Renault of Boulogne was proving effective, having placed his pikemen in a circle protecting his cavalry, which would charge when there were opportunities. 
The Count of Boulogne had opposed the battle, but fought the longest, while the mercenary de Beau fled when he saw that Ferrand had been captured. More Flemish infantry had arrived, but saw that the battle was already lost, and wisely refused to become part of the slaughter. Heavily outnumbered, the Count was finally captured. The victory cemented France's position as the dominant power in Europe. 130 knights had been captured by Philip, including five counts. Ferrand was led to Paris in chains and remained Philip's prisoner until 1227, when he no longer mattered. Boulogne was given to Philip's illegitimate son, Philip Urupel, and Renaud died in chains 13 years later. Although Otto avoided capture, the defeat ended his chances of regaining the German throne. In the end, John had to sign a five-year treaty with Philip that cost a fortune. John's two-front strategy had seemed a good idea, but required a level of cooperation and timing beyond the ability of either him or his allies. If he had simply sailed to Flanders and joined his allies, the combined army would have been unstoppable. The intervention of the Pope, who wanted to preserve the remaining knights for a crusade gave John a face-saving excuse to agree to a truce, and he then sailed back to England, broke and humiliated, giving his rebellious barons their opportunity. I will discuss those barons' demands, which led to the Magna Carta, and then a major revolt next episode. Thanks for listening.